Divini Cultus of Pope Pius XI on, on the protection of the liturgy. Since the Church has received from Christ, her founder, the mandate to protect the sanctity of divine worship, she certainly has the task of commanding, without prejudice to the substance of the sacrifice and the sacraments, over everything that concerns the perfect development of this august public ceremony, rites, formulas, prayers, and singing, that is, on everything that is properly called the name of liturgy, or sacred action par excellence. And the liturgy, in effect, is a sacred thing. Through it, in fact, we are elevated and united to God. We witness our faith, and we unite ourselves with him in the very strict duty of gratitude for the benefits and help we always need. Hence, the intimate bond that exists between dogma and the sacred liturgy, as well as between Christian worship and the sanctification of the people. For this reason, Celestine I believed that the canon of faith was expressed in the venerable formulas of the liturgy. In this regard, he affirms, the law of prayer determines the law of faith. In fact, when the prelates of the holy assemblies fulfill the functions entrusted to them, they support the cause of mankind before divine clemency, and pray and plead with the whole church that groans with them. Such collective prayers, first called Opus Dei and later Officium Divinum, as a kind of debt to be satisfied daily to God, were once carried out at night and during the day with great participation of the faithful. And it is marvelous to note how from ancient times those naive litanies which accompanied the sacred prayers and the liturgical action contributed to nourishing the religious fervor in the people. In fact, many in the old basilicas, where the bishop, the clergy, and the people alternated the divine praises, the liturgical songs helped to ensure that a large number of, of outsiders embraced Christianity and our civilization, as history teaches. It was in the temples that the opponents of Catholicism learned a deeper understanding of the dogma of the communion of saints. Thus it was that the Arian emperor Valens was almost stunned in front of the majesty of the divine mysteries celebrated by St. Basile, and in Milan, the heretics accused St. Ambrose of bewitching the crowds with liturgical songs, those same songs that struck Augustine to the point of inducing him to embrace the faith of Christ. Later, it was in the churches where almost all the citizens gathered as an immense choir that the artisans, architects, painters, sculptors, and writers themselves learned from the liturgy those theological knowledge that today shines wonderfully in medieval monuments. From this we understand why the Roman pontiffs had such great concern in protecting and safeguarding the sacred liturgy. And just as they used so much care in expressing the dogma with precise words, so they tried to put the sacred norms of the liturgy in order, defending them and preserving them from any alteration. And so we also understand why the Holy Fathers commented so much on the liturgy, that is, the law of prayer, verbally and in writing and why the Council of Trent wanted it to be exposed and explained to the Christian people. With regard to our modern times, Pius X and promulgating 25 years ago, with mo the modu proprio, the norms that regulate Gregorian chant and sacred music, set himself the main purpose of making the Christian spirit flourish and maintain in the faithful, providing with wise dispositions to remove anything that could conflict with the sanctity and dignity of the temple. In fact, the faithful gather in sacred places to draw piety from them as the first and main source, actively participating in the venerable mysteries of the church and in solemn public prayers. It is, therefore, very important that all that is intended for the beauty of the liturgy be regulated by the laws and prescriptions of the church, so that the arts truly serve, as is proper, as noble handmaids to divine worship, and this will not return to their detriment, but rather will give greater dignity and splendor as they are used in sacred places. This has been found in a wonderful way with regard to music. In truth, wherever the rules have been applied with care, there has also been, together with the resurgence of the most chosen forms of art, a widespread reflourishing of the religious spirit as the Christian people, permeated by a deeper liturgical sentiment, used to participate more actively in the Eucharistic rite, in the sacred psalmody, and in public prayers. We ourselves had a consoling confirmation then. However, we regret to note that those very wise laws have not been applied everywhere, 
and therefore the desired results have not been obtained. We know, in fact, that some have affirmed that they are not bound to the observance of those laws, which had been so solemnly enacted, that others, after a first adhesion, insensibly return to allow a certain kind of music that must be completely outlawed by the temple, and that finally, somewhere, especially on the occasion of centenary commemorations of illustrious musicians, a pretext was sought to perform compositions which, although remarkable, not responded either to the majesty of the sacred place or to the sanctity of the liturgical norms, were absolutely not to be performed in church. Thus, in order for the clergy and the people to obey more religiously the norms and prescriptions that must be wholly and inviolably observed, we like to add a few, suggested by the experience of these 25 years. And we do this even more willingly because this year not only the aforementioned restoration of sec sacred music is commemorated, but the memory of the famous monk Guido de Arezzo was also celebrated who, about 900 years ago, called to Rome by the Roman pontiff. He made known his ingenious system, thanks to which liturgical songs, coming from the ancient centuries, could be spread more easily and fully preserved, for the good and the decorum of the church and of art itself. In the Lateran Palace, where in the past St. Gregory the Great, after having collected, ordered, and increased the treasure of the sacred melody, inheritance, and monument of the fathers, had wisely constituted the famous Sculato, perpetuate the genuine interpretation of the liturgical chants. The monk Guido made a demonstration of his marvelous invention in the presence of the Roman clergy and the supreme pontiff himself, who, fully approving the initiative and warmly praising it, worked to ensure that the innovation could plan sp slowly spread everywhere and extend to all genres of music. Therefore, to all the bishops and ordinaries, who are especially responsible for the custody of the liturgy and the care of the sacred arts in the churches, we prescribe certain norms as if to respond to the vows that all the music congresses, especially the one just celebrated in Rome. We have received them from so many sacred pastors and illustrious scholars of the subject, to whom we all pay here the deserved praise, and we prescribe that such norms be put into practice according to the most effective means and methods that we list here. One. All those who are going to the priesthood, not only in seminaries but also in religious houses, should be instructed in Gregorian chant and sacred music from adolescence, since it will be easier in that age to learn everything related to singing and the sound. In the same way, it will be easier for them to eliminate or modify natural defects, if by chance they had any, and which would be impossible to remedy later in adulthood. Thus starting the teaching of singing and music from elementary school and continuing in the gymnasium and high school, future priests who have already become, without effort and difficulty, experts in singing will be able to receive the superior uh, skills that can well be said, aesthetics of Gregorian monody and of musical art, a polyphony and of the organ, a science that is most opportune for the clergy to possess. Two, therefore in the seminaries and in other institutes of study there should be a brief but frequent almost daily lesson of practice of gregorian chant and sacred music if thus is imparted with a truly liturgical spirit it will be rather a relief than a burden for the minds of the students after the tiring hours of other severe teachings consequently a more complete and perfect liturgical musical education of the clergy will undoubtedly bring the choral officiation back to its ancient dignity and splendor which is a primary part of divine worship and in the same way he will be able to restore the primitive glory to schools and musical chapels. 3. All those who are at the head of the basilicas, cathedrals, collegiate, and religious conventional churches must make every effort to restore the choral office according to the prescriptions of the church, not only for what is the generic practice of always performing the divine office with dignity, attention, and devoutness, but also as regards the art of singing, since in the psalmody one must pay attention both to the precision of the tones with their own middle and final cadences, to the convenient pause of the asterisk, and finally to pull concordance of the declamation of the verses, psalmodic, and stanzas of hymns. If all this is done scrupulously, everyone chanting according to the rules not only will demonstrate the unity of their spirits intent on praising God, but in the balanced alternation of the two wings of the choir, they will seem to emulate the eternal praise of the seraphim, who aloud they sang, Santo, 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 alternately. 4. In order that no one in the future has easy excuses for believing that he is exempted from the obligation to obey the laws of the church, all the orders of canons and all religious communities will have to deal with these provisions in special meetings. And as once there was the cantor or rector of the choir, so for the future in every choir of canons and religious, there should be a competent person 
who, while supervising the observance of the liturgical rules and choral singing, will correct and practice the defects of the uh, of those singing and of the entire choir. Nor should it be forgotten that, according to the ancient and constant discipline of the Church, and according to the same capitular constitutions still enforced, it is necessary that all those who are required to officiate in a choir should know at least Gregorian chant in a suitable way. By Gregorian chant, then, to be performed in every church, none excepted, it is meant only that which has been restored to the fidelity of the ancient codes, and which has already been proposed by the church in the authentic edition of the Vatican Printing House. 5. We want to recommend to those who are also responsible the musical chapels, which, following the ancient schools over time, were established in the basilicas and major churches to perform especially polyphonic music. Now, sacred polyphony legitimately holds the first place after Gregorian chant, and we strongly desire that such chapels, as they flourished from the 14th to the 16th century, be reconstituted and strengthened especially where the greater frequency and breadth of divine worship require a greater number of singers and a more accurate choice. 6. As for the schools of children, they must be established not only in the major churches and cathedrals, but also in the minor churches and parish churches and the children are educated there in the beautiful singing by the chapel masters, so that their voices, according to the ancient custom of the church, are added to the virile chorals, especially when in polyphonic music the sopranic part or the contus is entrusted to them as it always was. From the group of these children, especially in the 16th century, came the best composers of polyphony, including the greatest of all, Giovanni Pierluigi de Palestrina. 7. Indeed, since we have learned that somewhere an attempt is being made to reuse a genre of music which is absolutely contrasting with the celebration of divine offices, above all for the excessive use of instruments, we feel here the duty to affirm that more than singing with accompaniment, the instrument is the living voice that must resound in the temple. The human voice above every instrument, that is, the voice of the clergy, of the singers, of the people. Nor should it be believed that the church, placing the human voice before the sound of every instrument, is contrary to the progress of musical art. In fact, no instrument, no matter how exalted and perfect, can ever compete in force of expressiveness with the voice of man, especially when this is placed at the service of the soul to pray and praise the Almighty God. 8. But there is a musical instrument that belongs to the church and that comes from the ancestors, the organ, which, due to its marvelous grandeur and majesty, was considered worthy to be associated with liturgical rites, both accompanying the song and during the silences of the choir, according to the prescriptions of the church, spreading very sweet harmonies. However, even in this, that mixture of the sacred and the profane must be avoided, which, on the initiative of the builders on the one hand, and the very modern feats of certain organists on the other, threatens the very purpose for which this magnificent instrument is destined. We, too, without prejudice to the liturgical rules, wish that everything concerning the organ progresses continuously, but we cannot exempt ourselves from deploring that, as in other times with other music that the church rightly reproved, today attempts are made to introduce into the temple the worldly spirit with very modern forms. If such forms began to infiltrate, the church could not help but strongly condemn them. May only those organ harmonies res resonate in the temples which relate to the majesty of the place and perfume the sanctity of the rites. 9. In order for the faithful to participate more actively in divine worship, Gregorian chant, as far as it belongs to the people, is returned to the use of the people. In fact, it is absolutely essential that the faithful do not attend sacred functions as strangers or mute spectators, but truly understanding the beauty of the liturgy, participate in sacred ceremonies, even in the solemn processions where the clergy and pious associations intervene, in order to alternate, according to the due norms, their voice to those of the priest and the school. If what is hoped for happens, it will no longer happen that the people do not answer at all or just answer with a low murmur to the common prayers proposed in the liturgical language or in the vernacular. 10. Under the guidance of the bishops and ordinaries, the members of both clergy should do their utmost to ensure, either directly or with the help of experts, the teaching of the liturgy and music to the people, as disciplines, closely linked to Christian doctrine. And this will be achieved more easily if schools, pious associations, and other associations are educated in the liturgical field. Furthermore, the communities of religious sisters and pious female institutions should work zealously to achieve this goal in the various educational institutes entrusted to them. We are equally confident that those societies that in various regions, obeying the ecclesiastical authorities, work to restore sacred music according to the norms of the Church, will contribute to the realization of this objective. 11. 
To realize all these hopes, it is absolutely necessary to have experienced teachers in large numbers. In this regard, we cannot help but pay due praise to those schools and institutes founded here and there for the Catholic world, teaching the musical disciplines with all care and diligence. They form good and valiant teachers. But above all, we hereby want to remember and praise the Pontifical School of Sacred Music, founded in Rome by Pius X in 1910. This school, which then our immediate ancestor, Benedict XV, fervently supported and to which he gave a new seat, also by us is surrounded by a particular favor, as a precious inheritance left to us by two popes, and therefore for we warmly recommend it to all ordinaries. We know very well how much effort the above prescriptions require, but who is unaware of the many artistic masterpieces created by our ancestors? who, overcoming so many difficulties imbued with religious fervor and liturgical spirit, have left us. Nor is this in the least surprising. Everything that has its origin in the interior life of the Church transcends the most perfect things on earth. The difficulties of this most holy initiative, instead of depressing the pastors of the Church, will excite and stimulate them. They unanimously and constantly obeyed our will, will all lend to the Supreme Pontiff a work very worthy of their Episcopal ministry. These things we prescribe, declare, and order. We want this apostolic act to be and always remain firm, valid and effective, and realize and obtain its full and integral effects, despite anything to the contrary. Therefore, no one may violate this constitution promulgated by us, or rashly oppose it. Given in Rome at St. Peter's, on the 50th anniversary of our priesthood, on the 20th of December, 1928, the seventh year of our pontificate, Pope Pius XI.